Gardi from the National Bureau of Criminal Investigation began digging inside the field yesterday afternoon as part of their ongoing search into the disappearance of Fiona Sinnott. Fiona Sinnott was last seen alive just a few miles from here in February 1998, leaving this pub in the village of Broadway with her ex-boyfriend. Nearly eight years on, there have been no sightings of the mother of one. Just over 24 years ago, Fiona Sinnott, 19 years of age, and mother of 11-month-old Emma, disappeared after a night out with her friends. Her ex-boyfriend was the last to see her alive. While Fiona is included in the vanishing triangle disappearances of 1993 to 1998, her family and friends are said to have their own idea of what happened to Fiona and who did it. And Gardy have said they believe she knew her killer. But he has never been charged and the family over the years have not named him through fear and wanting to protect Fiona's daughter, Emma. And so I also will not be pointing the finger. As I've said before, Ireland is a small place. All I can do is tell Fiona's story. Fiona was the baby of the family. She was very protected by them. Her brothers and sisters always looked out for her. Her mother would say she lit up your heart. That is the type of person she was. She was real bubbly and mischievous, breaking into farmers' fields and jumping on the bales as a child. Sure, we all did it if you were from the country. She lived nearest to the school, but she was the one that was always the last to school. She'd sit beside her best friend and always copy her homework, as she wouldn't have hers done. She was definitely a daddy's girl, her siblings would say. But one never knows what's around the corner. What can be a very sleepy village in the southeast of Ireland? Things can happen that can definitely surprise people. Fiona was an independent 16 year old who grew up near Kilmore Quay in County Wexford, a small fishing village in the southeast of Ireland. When she met Sean Carl, he was 10 years older than her. Cool, exciting, a bit wild and drove a motorbike. He was everything a 16 year old would want at that age and she was really happy. They'd go off on bike trips and it opened up her eyes to not always being around, just her friends and family and living in Kilmore Quay. Fiona and Sean would soon move in together in Wexford Town. She was just 17. Not long after Fiona would get pregnant and she was over the moon. But after a few months and six months pregnant, the family could see a change in Fiona. She wasn't her usual bubbly self. She was suffering a different side to the relationship and she didn't know how to handle it. Her neighbour would say there was a lot of shouting and screaming, doors slamming and just a very toxic situation. Fiona thought things would get better once the baby was born, but things got worse. Carl would punch walls and also get physical with Fiona. After a beating, she wouldn't go out for a few days because she was so bruised and battered and she definitely wouldn't see her family. They had no idea how bad it had gotten. In June 1997, Fiona, Carl and Emma moved to Ballyhit in County Wexford and by November they had separated. After breaking up with Carl, she stayed living in the house with her daughter Emma. Just a 20 minute walk from the village of Broadway, which is halfway between Rosslare Harbour and Kilmore Quay. She got a job at a local pub restaurant and even got herself a bicycle to get around on. She was getting her life together and experiencing freedom for the first time in a long time. On Sunday the 8th of February 1998, Fiona was out with friends in her local pub Butlers in Broadway. Her and her friends joked and chatted about their night out the previous Friday. They played pool and drank and at around midnight her friends decided to go to Rosslare to a disco but Fiona declined, preferring to go home. Fiona's ex, Sean Carl, was also drinking in Butler's pub that night, but not in Fiona's company. Even though they had broken up months before, they still were seeing each other on and off, which I gather the family didn't know. Before Fiona was to leave, she rang her sister Diana to ask her to send their brother Seamus to the pub. She was very insistent, but Seamus was living in Waterford at the time and he had work as a fisherman at 5 a.m and he really didn't want to be driving all the way to Wexford that night. Even though Fiona was insistent, she wouldn't say why she needed her brother to meet her, and unfortunately they would never find out. 
Fiona would leave the pub at around midnight with her ex Carl and they were overheard arguing. Later when Carl was interviewed, he admitted that he had walked Fiona home, spent the night on the couch and when he woke up the next morning, he saw her in the bed and she said she was going to the doctor that morning as she wasn't feeling well. But she had no money for the bus and he gave her three pounds. His mother then collected him in her car from there at around 9 a.m. Fiona would not turn up for her doctor's appointment and her family waited all that day for her to call to the home place, but again, she never showed up. It wouldn't be until the 18th of February that Fiona would be reported missing by her father. You see, like I said before, Fiona was a very independent young woman. In the past, she had previously left home to visit Cork for a couple of days. You always have to take into account the fact that she lived 16 kilometres away from her family home and that mobile phones were uncommon at the time. Before the rise of handheld devices, communication occurred through landline phones, snail mail or face-to-face conversations. That's why the family meet-up every Friday was so important. It was a time for them to see each other and catch up. When Fiona didn't turn up that first Friday, her family didn't think too much about it. But when she didn't turn up on the second Friday, well then they started to get worried. Fiona's father contacted Kilmore Key Guard Station to inform them that his daughter had not been seen in public since the 8th of February. In response, a full-scale missing persons investigation was launched. Carl was one of the first to be contacted as he was the last known person to be seen with Fiona. Carl admitted to being with Fiona that Sunday night, the 8th of February, and gave the story of leaving the next morning and going back to his family home with his mother to where Emma, Fiona and his daughter was staying. You see, it was a regular thing that every weekend Carl's parents would pick up Emma on the Friday, keep her for the weekend and drop her back on the Monday. And yet they had kept Emma from the time of Friday the 6th of February to when Fiona was reported missing. And yet they themselves didn't question where and why was Fiona not picking up her daughter or why was she not at her house? They just kept Emma. There was a theory that Fiona may have left for England as on the Friday before she was last seen, she had met a trucker and spent the night with him in his cab. Maybe she had met up with him again and went off with him. Guardy made contact with the trucker and his alibi checked out as he was able to prove to investigators that he had been driving in the continent when Fiona went missing. When the Gardaí went to Fiona's house to see if there was any evidence of foul play, what they noticed was the whole house was stripped bare of any trace of not only Fiona, but Emma also. You could not tell that a teenager and an 11 month old ever lived there. Later on, locals would recall seeing over a dozen black refuse bags lined up outside the property. Also, a farmer would come forward after hearing the news of Fiona missing and report that he had found a number of black bags dumped in the corner of one of his fields. Inside these bags he found items and documents that had Fiona's name on them. Unfortunately, the farmer had set fire to these bags as he thought that it was just another case of illegal dumping. The correspondence that he discovered had a different address to the address of Fiona's. In fact, it turned out that it was the address of the apartment Fiona had previously lived in with Carl. It was at this point in the investigation that Gardie began to suspect that somebody was trying to mislead them into thinking that Fiona had run away. At the time Fiona disappeared, Emma, her daughter, was about to turn one and Fiona was so excited and wouldn't have missed it for the world and her sister was about to turn 21. She even had plans to go to Waterford to get the presents for both. She had two big celebrations coming up and this led credence to a widely held belief by her family and friends that she did not run away. When both these special occasions came and went and still no sign of Fiona, they truly felt she was gone and wouldn't be coming back. Since day one, the Gardaí have been convinced that Fiona's body is buried somewhere in the south of Wexford. In June 1998, the nearby lake in Ladies Island was drained with Gardaí keeping a 24-hour floodlit watch. The operation lasted a month and the entire lake was searched. 
However, no trace of Fiona was found. Searches at other lakes and suggested burial sites also failed to turn up anything. In 2001, a man that was suspected of having been involved in the disposal of Fiona's body died from a suspected drug overdose in his car. This man was finding it increasingly difficult to live with the guilt of having been involved. However, he could not provide the guardie with an anonymous tip-off because only three people knew about the exact location of Fiona. Telling somebody, he said, would be signing his own death warrant. On the 16th of September 2005, Gardy announced that they were treating the case of Fiona as a murder investigation. Earlier that day at around 7am, the prime suspect in the murder of Fiona was arrested at his home and detained. In the days leading up to the arrest, five other people had been detained on suspicion of withholding information. Over the course of three days, six people were arrested. The prime suspect, his mother, his sister, his sister's boyfriend, his ex-girlfriend and a male friend. In the end, no charges were filed. These arrests came on the back of vital information from a woman known to the prime suspect. After Fiona disappeared, it came to light that Fiona had suffered a number of brutal assaults at the hands of Carl. On more than one occasion, she was hospitalised as a result of these attacks. However, Fiona would never press charges. He said to me, that's what no, he said to me that he wasn't going to leave. He said he's, he's just going to really, really shit started. He said to me something like, oh man, of course he is. Really? Why like? Because it just doesn't like me. Anymore. You'd be like, Jerry, like, five people should tell me, like, I would be able to look at them. Like, but I tried, like, like, before this, like, so I don't come back to him again. In 2004, Fiona's father passed away at the age of 57. It is said that he'd go to the gate at the front of the house every night to wait for her to come home. His family said he died of a broken heart. In January 2006, it was reported that when Fiona's family were at a dig site, they were spat at by a man while they searched for her body. The man in question also laughed at her grieving relatives. This family have done so much searching and digging, with and without the Gardaí. They have gone down septic tanks, dug up foundations of houses, searched quarries and fields. Any place they have been told to look, they have looked. I've never seen such hands-on from a family searching for their loved ones. In 2007, a skull was found on Cat Strand. However, investigators soon learned it belonged to an older and smaller woman. In July 2006, Carl was charged and sentenced to three months in jail for threatening to kill or cause serious bodily harm to a man that was dating his sister. On appeal, Carl was released on bail. In 2007, Carl was successful in his appeal and his prison sentence was quashed. He was told to stay away from the defendant unless otherwise stated by the defendant. On the 13th of September 2008, what would be Fiona's 30th birthday. The family had put up a memorial plaque for her and it was going to be unveiled on the day. Only the night before it was ripped from the wall in the cemetery. I don't think we have to look too far for the suspect. In June 2017, Fiona's sister Caroline passes away suddenly from a short illness while living in Wales and she was brought home and buried with her father. In December 2017, it was reported that the chief suspect in Fiona's murder had fled to another country in an attempt to complicate any further extradition bids. It is said he had previously lived in the UK and in Spain, and he had recently moved to another country. This country was not named. Fiona's daughter Emma was raised by Carl's parents, and the last time Fiona's family saw her was a week before Fiona disappeared. She would be in her early 20s now. The Sinnott family have tried to get in touch over the years, but to no avail. They didn't just lose Fiona, they lost the closest thing to her. They said she knows they are trying to make contact with her. While the Sinnott family always held on to the hope that they would find Fiona's body, they now believe that this will only be possible if someone comes forward with new information. They have said also, they may not get the information from the prime suspect, but we definitely believe there are one or two people, local people, who know. 
We are just hoping that after all these years, they'll help us and speak up because we are not going to stop.